This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius 137 across North America, and from PRI, Public Radio International in the United States. Well, Ayan Hirsi Ali has lived many different lives, often in exile and for many years under the threat of death. Born into a deeply religious Somali family, her father's politics forced them to flee their home in Mogadishu for Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, and finally Kenya. In her early 20s, she fled an arranged marriage with a Somali-Canadian living in Toronto. She landed in the Netherlands and went to university. There, her growing disillusionment with Islam was cemented by the 9-11 attacks. She became an active in Dutch politics and was elected to Parliament, where she became known as a fierce critic of Dutch multiculturalism. Ali began speaking out against Islamic extremism, condemning in particular the treatment of women in Islam. Dutch director Theo van Gogh was murdered by a radical Islamic fundamentalist after collaborating with Ali on a controversial film called Submission. A threatening note left on his body was addressed to Ayan Hirsi Ali, She went into hiding and began to live with round-the-clock bodyguards. In 2006, she resigned from Parliament after it was revealed that she had lied to Dutch authorities during her immigration process. She moved on to the United States, taking a job at the right-wing think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, where she remains today. Her memoir about her early life, Infidel, became a bestseller in 2007, and her outspoken and often provocative statements about Islam have made her a lightning rod for controversy. Her new book is called Nomad, also a memoir, and Ayan Hersi Ali joins me now live in Studio Q. Hello. Hello, and uh, please allow me to make one correction. Please. Which is the fact that I lied about my asylum wasn't reve- was revealed in 2002, and it led to my citizenship being taken away in 2006, even though the minister who took it away knew. She said she didn't, but she knew about it, and I was given back to me in six weeks uh, because everybody in government and in parliament and in the news and the entire nation knew about it uh, two and a half years before my citizenship was taken. Okay, notation made. (laughs) Notation made, yeah. Good to have you here. Thank you, thank you for having Uh, me. You you know, it's interesting. You're here in Toronto, the city where you would have ended up if uh, you had chosen to go through with your arranged marriage. Does does being here give you pause to think about what your life might have been like? Well, in uh, the chapter on my sister in Nomad, I reflect after my father's death on, well, what if I had just been a good girl? What if I had been obedient? Um, you know, I could have been, I could have saved my father so much heartache. Yes. And then I reflect on my half-sister's life, the one who stayed and who did what my father told her to do. And she lives in the Tower Hamlets. These are the projects in London, uh, on the east end of London. And I thought, and when I think back, you know, this is, we're just hypothesizing. If I had come to Toronto, that might have been my fate. I might have lived somewhere in the projects, um, like many Muslim women mm. in Muslim attire, and uh, kind of repeating the life that my mother led and the life that my half sister lives in London. And you're grateful that you did not make that decision. Uh, in hindsight, I am grateful that I didn't make that decision. I don't. I don't feel any sense of sin or guilt about it afterwards. Tell me about that decision. Tell me about the moment of the decision. You were in Germany. You're on your way to Toronto. You have been sent, essentially, by your father's decree to to get married to this uh, a Somali Canadian that he's identified. Uh, tell me about that moment and making the decision and the ability to to jump off the train, <laughs> so be it. Well, f- first of all, the marriage itself was in February of 1992. And I happened to be in Germany in July of 1992. And the man that I married off to uh, comes back. He was working here in, uh, in, in Canada, so he had to go back. So I had the time to fantasize about escaping, about getting away. And I played with the idea of once I came to Toronto being such a bad wife that he would divorce me mm. of his volition. Then I thought that was too risky. But anyway, I, I thought about running away in Kenya. That wasn't uh, the much of an option. So when I find myself in Germany, and not only that, I find there Somali asylum seekers, women who couldn't read or write asking for asylum. One of them was, uh, you know, she had come to our home in Nairobi. And I called her. She was in uh, Holland, and I asked if I could come and visit her without telling her what I intended to do. 
And she said, oh, sure. So I was able to take a train. For instance, uh, the opportunity of trains that go between countries. I don't know if you know about the Schengen arrangement, the arrangement in the EU that if you have a visa for one country, I had a visa for Germany, that gave me access to four other right, countries. Right. Th there was all of this opportunity, and within two or three days of my arrival in Germany, I decided I'll just give it a go. Bold, bold steps to, to, to defy your father, and, and, uh, uh, and, and you end up in Netherlands. And Ian, what were your expectations about life in the West, and how accurate did they turn out to be? Well, my expectations at that point were not that much. I really just wanted to prove to my family. I knew what I was running away from. I didn't know what I was running to. And but I you ha must have had some idea that this was going to be emancipating or that this was going to be somehow better than wh wh the way you uh, perceived you were living. Well, the way I perceived it was I didn't want to repeat my mother's life. Right. And not just my mother's life, but all these other women around me. And I'm 22, and I'm talking about women who are slightly older than me, much older than me, and I just saw my life pass me by. Mm. So I knew what I did not want, and the idea was I'm going to prove to my family that I will not come back uh, begging with my tail between my legs, that I wasn't going to be a horror, that I wasn't going to sin in, you know, most Muslim women mm -hmm. are frightened into not leaving the family because they're going to sin. So I, at that time, I'm telling myself, okay, I'm just going to work. Um, I'm going to, I didn't want to learn the Dutch language initially. I thought I could get by with my English. I had learned English in Kenya. But very quickly, it became apparent that I couldn't really get by with my, I had to learn the Dutch language. And so then I got absorbed into the assimilation process and didn't really have big ideas about what I wanted to become, what the West represented. But I was fascinated by such things. You know, I ended up in an asylum seeker center that was full of literally Muslims. There were some Russian asylum seekers. There were some Serbian asylum seekers. There were some people from places like Zaire, but most of the asylum seekers were Muslim. Mm. And I, that just made me think, gee, they're the infidels. We are the chosen ones. We have the last book and the last prophet. And why are we all here? Mm. And we came from different countries. I mean, as far as Azerbaijan, places that I didn't even know existed. And that led me then to, in any case, not so much think about Islam or think about uh, what was going on, but I thought I want to know what it is that they have that we don't have. And my father had They being the West or... or the, the, the infidels. The infidels, yeah. <laughs> they, because right. I mean, within the Somali community, you have to think of it this way. When we talked about the Dutch, we always said the Galo. Right, and Gala right. just means infidel or unbelieving. And so what, what is it that the unbelievers have that we don't have? And gradually, I started developing an idea of, for instance, what value systems are, and mm -hmm. that there are several and not just one, as I was brought up. Uh, and then based on uh, your experiences, and you were brought up in a deeply religious uh, family, uh, you, you become very outspoken. Uh, against Islam. I mean, this is, you've become famous and infamous for this. Some argue that your views have been shaped by experiences with fundamentalist Islam that are not typical of the many millions of people who grew up under a more uh, moderate version of Islam. How do you respond to that? Well, I just point out to the data. I mean, uh, let's even imagine that I, I wasn't born. But if you look at uh, the growth of the Islamic Brotherhood in Egypt, if you look at places like Pakistan that have been completely Islamized uh, by with Saudi money, and by Islamization I mean Islamism, uh, Wahhabism, that have been completely hollowed out. Um, the country of your origin, Iran, when Khomeini comes to power, he's elected, Sharia law is introduced, a country that was with a, a great history and a huge number of educated people and middle class people is turned around into the regime of tyranny and totalitarianism. totalitarianism right, that but has the Muslims so in Iran, in many of the um, in many, many of the Muslims in Iran do not have the experience that you have had in particular. But when and I talk about fundamentalist Islam, that is fundamental Islam 
Islam as it is perceived by those people who want to introduce Sharia law, those people with a political agenda, and mm. if that doesn't work out, who would employ jihad? And if you look at the number of countries where that form of radical Islam is present, and I talk in infidel about how we are first visited, how I first make contact with radical Islam from the so-called informal, just spiritualist Islam to the more Wahhabist, more jihadist uh, mm -hmm. type of Islam. And I think that even if you just erase me from the equation, what you will see is that there is a revived uh, radical puritanical Islam. It has a following, it has resources, and there are some nation states that support that actively. And that right now there is no counter uh, argument. And I'm talking about content, not okay, just Let me people ask condemning. you about the counter argument. Because yeah. in Nomad, in your book, you do argue that Muslim Im immigrants need new alternatives to radical Islam in the West. Aren't those alternatives already readily available here? I mean, isn't that what some fundamentalists consciously reject in terms of uh, a Western, more moderate uh, uh, Islamic ideas? If I, again, now I'm going to take you back to my experience. Okay. These ideas on about how to build a society, uh, the relationship between men and women, I stumbled on them when I went to the University of Leiden and found these books. If we say, well, let's just allow all Muslims to stumble into them when they come here, that's one way of doing it. But we see from the last few decades that many Muslims don't do that. Some do that and completely accept it. And some do that find out about it and completely reject it. So given that equation, given in the context of Islamic terrorism and what's going on, I think it is time that other people with these other moral alternatives actively seek out Muslim communities mm. and offer it to them the way the jihadis are doing. But there are different kinds of Muslim groups. It's a, it's not only about stumbling <laughs> into it, is there? I mean, there are active, what you might term, I mean, these are strange terms, moderate, radical anyway, but what, what, what you would, I think, call a more moderate uh, Islamic group or Muslim groups in Canada, there's, there's, there's many. Uh, oh, you don't have to stumble, you know, uh, go ahead. They are in Canada, they are in Holland, they are in the UK, in America, uh, m individuals from Muslim countries who identify themselves as Muslim, who find out like you and like Irshad Banji, I have a bunch of friends, we, you know, there are a huge number of them. Mm -hmm. It's just that they are not the largest group. Uh, to, to consider yourself to be the mainstream is to deny the facts in front of us, which is you are a small group, the fundamentalists are a small group, but an increasing number, and then there is a silent group of people who are right now being targeted, are being, uh, my publisher today was telling me about the situation in Canada where a, a Muslim informant, uh, I don't know what his name is, but uh, came to say, this. look what is happening, these kids are being indoctrinated with videos of mm -hmm. beheadings and uh, uh, hostility to the society that they have chosen and the people doing that don't find competition in that same household. So if the situation in Holland, which I know the best, is you have these satellite dishes, you have online material, you have active agents who go to these communities, knock on their doors and sell their ideological wares. And besides them, no one else is going mm -hmm. there to offer them something else other than that. Let me ask you about the, the way you. But by, by the way, I don't want to misrepresent myself as a very active Muslim. It's it's the family I come from. I, I you know uh, that's my background, and and it's certainly uh, a fundamentalist Islam wouldn't represent my family. But uh, but uh, I, I want to ask you about your. For lack of a better word, your tactics, the way you've decided, because I understand where you're coming from, but the way you've decided to go about this. In a chapter in this book entitled Letter to My Grandmother, at one point you write, I'm quoting you, uh, I have compared the infidels' morals to those that you have taught us, and I must report that they have in practice a better outcome for humans than the morals of your foref forefathers. You're talking to your grandmother. Mm. I, and do you not worry that statements like this might alienate the Muslims that you want to engage? Um, it might alienate some, but then those will be the ones who aren't interested in hearing the message anyway. Uh, I might alienate people who already had an alternative agenda and will feel very angry that their agenda is being disrupted. But the reasonable individual who shares a background with me and a grandmother like mine and what she represents, we can compare notes and say, 
What do you think, for instance, we have tried clanism, we have tried Sharia in Somali, um, we have tried different forms of living together mm. and we've failed miserably. I don't think that there are many Somalis who will deny that Somalia is a failure. Is it possible if I speak to such a person to say, well, given that fact, could we try some other political theory that's actually been a success, for instance, in the West? And that applies to the Muslim from Iraq and the Muslim from Iran and the Muslim from Saudi right. Arabia. But if you set up a We've moral hierarchy, uh, and, and in this case saying that the West is effectively better. Not to the use West, your, but I mean ideas. Well, the, the infidels, right? The infidels <laughs> idea. Uh, uh, a, a better outcome for humans. The do you do you not thereby risk the same kind of thing you accuse uh, some Muslims of doing, which is uh, to, to set up this hierarchy between... Well, if you, if, you, if you look, if you read it very superficially, that's, I think, what you will find in there. But if you really get the message that I want to convey, which mm. is... Um, Ideas can be judged on their merits, and there are good ideas and there are bad ideas. And if, as humanity, we make use of our reason and we experiment with some of them, and over and over again we repeat these traditions, these habits, these mm. uh, convictions, and we pass them on from generation to generation, and every generation keeps failing, and by failure I mean measured by prosperity and peace, and individual freedom and responsibility, then I'm prepared to say, perhaps it's time now to experiment with alternative ideas. And Sharia as a system of law for society, Islamic law, has failed over and over again and everywhere where it's tried, again measured by those, you know, by uh, prosperity, freedom, um, and peace and peaceful relations. It's failed people. everywhere it's been tried. Everywhere it's been tried. Look at the country of your origin. Look at the country of my origin. Look at a country like Saudi Arabia, where they're actually wealthy. They have oil wealth. But 80% of the curriculum is reading the Quran and learning it by heart. And if you compare it to other ideas, other political theories that mm. have been implemented in places like Canada and Europe and America, that are not perfect. They are absolutely not perfect. But on a on a large generic scale, if you compare a society that is built on liberal mm. on liberalism versus a society that is built on what Muhammad left behind and a system of Sharia, mm. then I mean the results speak for themselves. But surely this is subjective based on the the experience that somebody has in you know one of those places. I mean I'm sure that surely there would be people in front in your country of origin or in Iran or, or wherever who would say our our lives are fantastic and better under Sharia law than than what uh, you might be experiencing in the Netherlands. Well, if they were subjective, then we wouldn't have large groups of Muslims leaving Muslim countries, coming to infidel lands mm. to share in the material prosperity. I want us Back to, to take... Back to your asylum, your group of asylum. Of asylum yeah, yeah, yeah. seekers, yeah. So let's take it to the next step and say, it's great to see all this material wealth and the uh, peace and you know uh, freedom that we have in doing what we want when uh, here let's also start talking about the ideas that underlie that the principles and even the history this was the great thing about doing political science was i didn't just learn about a certain idea and when implemented whether it was good or bad but about the history of how these ideas came about the struggle behind it these countries that we live in but the where, west where, weren't free in the past where do corrupt governments come into this where does where did despotic leaders come into this where does the military hunters come into this. I mean, why does this have to be about Islam? Why is this about a religion? It's been Islamized. Despots like Mubarak, um, despots like the Saudi, is even the Saudi family, despots like Saddam Hussein, despots even like uh, you know the Syrian uh, president, uh, the various Assads, all use Islam as an instrument. Religion, Islam as an instrument for preserving their power, the opposition to them, uh, the Islamic Brotherhood in all its different names, also use Islam as the moral source for where you can find answers for society. So given that, that both the despots and the, um, and the opposition are using the ideal, the utopia of a Sharia as the promised way of living together, I think and, and given the fact that many of us from Muslim countries come here in search of a better life, that maybe it would help us if we also uh, learned a little bit about the ideas and the principles and the history of how these ideas came about, maybe adopted them. But adopting those new values ultimately will mean shedding some of the old ones. And that is the painful 
That's the painful transition. Let's, let's segue into learning. In Nomad, you identify public education, uh, the Christian church, the feminist movement, as the key Western institutions that can offer alternative ideas to Muslims in the West. Let's begin with education. What, what should teachers be doing? Um, if I were to advise teachers in the West who encounter Muslim students, I would teach them um, the skills of self-reflection and of criticism, not to have to take in things just because an authority says so. Unfortunately, many of us born into Islam are taught by rote, are taught to internalize that the Holy Quran is the true unswerving God, uh, word of God and that we should follow in the guidance of Prophet Muhammad. He's the authority. And if Muslim children could only be taught that to reflect, to learn about different ideas and different religions and make up their minds as individuals. I would advise teachers uh, who encounter Muslim students to give them sexual education. That means that they take responsibility for their actions, uh, pretty much like Christian students. Uh, so uh, mis mystery and mystifying sexuality almost always leads to terrible things. Mm. And it also leads and as you see it in Muslim communities, that the position of women becomes one where her virginity and her chastity and her sexuality is controlled mm -hmm. by the male side of, of the family. And that kind of education for both of them would be great. Again, there is the use of violence, or at least getting used to it. If you do something wrong, if you don't obey, then a husband has the right to beat his wife, a father has the right to beat his daughter. These are things that happen in all societies, but they happen in large part in Muslim communities. And the act of self-reflection would teach us to look at ourselves and improve these habits. You identify yourself as an atheist. Some may be surprised to hear you call on Christians to reach out to Muslims. As a non-believer yourself, yep. what do you think the Christian church can offer Muslims? Well, if you say, has God created man or has man created God, I believe in the latter. I, f I believe that man created God. And man didn't just create God. There are different concepts of God. Different men created different gods. And if I look at the evolved concept of the Christian God today, that the mainstream Christians in the West follow, to the unevolved, harsh, desert-inspired uh, concept of a God that Muhammad introduced, then I think that for those Muslims who, and I, some of them after I published Infidel, wrote to me and feel sorry for me, saying, you know, it was, we agree with you on everything you say about Islam, but we can't live without a God. How can you live without a God? Mm -hmm. I would rather they adopt that concept of an evolved, science-friendly, human-friendly, female-friendly, and uh, not so hom homophobic uh, God uh, that the Christians have developed. And I'm talking about the evolved one. And I describe intimately which what I mean. Um, so not the relativists and not the extremists, in, because that also exists in Christianity, let's be honest. But that mainstream evolved idea where having a God above you and believing means that it's something that is intimate, tolerant, and you don't impose on others. You're very eloquent, but with each statement that you make, I know that you're. <laughs> it's very provocative what you're saying. Uh, you know, for for a lot of people, it's a, to to hear. I'm speaking with Ian Hersey Ali. Her new book is called Nomad, uh, and uh, she joins me here in in uh, in Studio Q. Uh, why single out Christianity? I mean, what 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 about Judaism, Buddhism, other faiths? Have you been through all of those, and you find that the Christian Church is the best answer? Oh no, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism. Uh, Jude, I have a lot of Jewish friends. They don't proselytize. In fact, it's very, very difficult to become Jewish at all. That's right. Something like your mother has to be Jewish or you have to go through a very elaborate conver conversion uh, process. I was, when I wrote this, I was thinking of ways to compete with those agents of radical Islam who have found their way to these vulnerable communities, Muslim communities, who are offering these people a very simplistic very dangerous message that unfortunately many of these um, Muslims, especially the young men, are adopting. And I thought, what if we had some form of competition, some other guys going in there? They could be Buddhists, they could be Christians, they could be uh, feminists, and they could also be uh, people uh, who have adopted enlightenment, humanists I call them, but just create competition. 
we are failing. We are investing in the West a lot of money in military. We're investing a lot of money in uh, all kinds of security measures that involve the secret service, that involve a lot of legislation, that involve the state. But when it comes to the simple idea of competing with other ideas for the hearts and minds of those vulnerable immigrants, we are failing in that. We're just giving, they have a monopoly. Jihadists mm. now have a monopoly in that marketplace. But uh, b- back to the, the Christian church. I, uh, and I know that you're, you're going to say, well, if this is, this is a superficial reading of what you're saying. No, but, but I, they write but, to me. I told to you. So, so, I mean, some, I'll show you some of the emails. Y- that is, they, people just feel, I, I, would, I can live without a God. But right. I know that there are tons and tons of people who can't and who don't want to. And in that case, then it's perhaps better to introduce a friendlier God. But, but did, okay, so to, to distill it down, you are essentially saying the Christian Church is more evolved than the Muslim than, than Islam. The uh, Christian churches are more evolved than Islam, and not only that. Um, in the name of Islam, war has been declared on the West. And given that fact, so I belong to the, after the 11th of September, Samuel Huntington and his thesis came back, which he wrote in 1993. And there were some people who rejected his thesis categorically. And there were some people who thought maybe it's plausible. I belong to the group of people, the school of thought, who who think that what Samuel Huntington wrote is plausible, and it's actually being, it's, we are living in it. Given that thesis, given if you accept the assumption that there is a clash of civilizations, that Islam has declared war on the West, then one way for the West to strengthen itself is to revive its ideas of freedom mm. and tolerance and pluralism and friendly Christianity and go into Muslim neighborhoods in Christian lands, in Western lands, and compete with the jihadists. And just to get you, I mean, have not other have, have not wars been prosecuted in the name of other, other religions? In, in the, the name of Christianity, yes. In the past, but that's why I talk about an evolved Christianity, you, a reformed well, Christianity, an enlightened Christianity. You don't think that that happens today? You don't think that uh, in the name of Christianity or other religions outside of Islam, people are fighting wars? In the na- th- they are marginal. I'm not talking about other religions, but ju- Christianity. We live in the West. Christianity originated in the West and is in the West today. And I find, but you may disagree with me, that the extremists uh, among Christians are a minority and that in the West, mainstream Christians belong to evolved, enlightened mm. churches and communities. I'm not here to defend Christianity, but I think given yeah, the right. danger of jihadism and its success in Western countries, perhaps it's time that the evolved, enlightened Christians introduce their friendly God to Muslims in search of a better life here, who are now only being sought after by jihadists. You say that Western feminists uh, have let Muslim women down. How so? Well, I look at what feminists... I've given in the in the book the example of Germaine Greer, mm-hmm. and she's not the only one by any definition. There were many feminists... Uh, iconic ones who when confronted with the situation of women from developing countries not just Muslim women sort of dismiss it as that is their culture and uh, rationalize it and Mm. apologize for it and that created uh, and I think especially in the West creates first of all parallel societies where minorities minority men can oppress their women and argue culture or religion but it also excludes women, especially those who need it the most, from developing world, the developing world who come here from the gains that Western feminists have made. And I think it is very, very, very important that especially given, I, and I only focus on radical Islam because of the context of terrorism, that's what I study, that you see more and more women who want to get out of that tribal, uh, radical religious family setting and mm. community that is swallowing them up and that they don't know how to articulate uh, their ideas and their principles mm-hmm. and that they meet with a lot of violence. And the women who who have networks and organizations and a history of emancipation are not sharing with them the tools, but also the language of articulating and recognizing what it is that is oppressing them. But it's such a difficult line between taking on what we might perceive to be dangerous uh, religious formalism or fundamentalism 
and at the same time respecting cultural tradition. How do you walk that line? Well, when you have conversations in women's shelters, Muslim women's shelters, with the perpetrators of, uh, uh, with the men who commit the acts of violence, all of them, all of them say, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not just being dysfunctional, I'm not beating her just because it gives me an urge of pleasure. She disobeyed me. Then they go back and they don't mention culture. They don't just don't say it's culture, even though I find it very difficult to separate culture and religion. But they say it is Islam. It's my God. It's chapter 4, verse 34. I have the duty to beat her if she's disobedient. Now, in my experience in the Netherlands, and I've seen it in other arguments here, it, people arguing this, imams arguing for it and preaching it in radical Islamic literature, if a wife is disobedient, beat her. If a daughter is disobedient, beat her. There are all these practices of honor killings. It's justified in the name of Islam. There is the man in Georgia, his uh, daughter. He married off his daughter. She ran away from the marriage and came, went back to her father. He stabbed her to death. When the police came, he said, it's my religion. I, th I don't think you can ignore such statements and such justifications. I think it is time now to link. It's not enough to just condemn the act of cruelty against women. It's also important to link it to the justifications that the perpetrators are using. That is what the feminists in the West did. They were subjugated in the name of Christianity, in the name of tradition, in the name of this or that, and they learned to articulate that, and they learned to teach their children and their grandchildren that those weren't good arguments anymore. Why should we exclude Muslims and Muslim women from that evolution? And let me ask you where you identify yourself politically. Uh, you said that you don't consider yourself a conservative. Uh, you are an advocate of classic uh, liberalism in the tradition of Voltaire. But you do work for the American Enterprise Institute, a right-wing think tank. Are you frustrated by the left-right divide and efforts to pin, you d pin your, d your place down in, in the political spectrum? I am frustrated by the left-right divide because that left-right divide just doesn't address and doesn't... It doesn't include you. <laughs> no, 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 it just doesn't... I mean, first of all, there's this whole desire for labeling people instead of listening to the argument, looking at the evidence, and based on that, uh, changing uh, your mind about it. I mean, would, would it matter if I were an extreme right wing or an extreme left wing? Would it matter if I weren't even born? What would my identity matter? The things that I'm talking about, um, I think one has to look at the evidence to see is, does Sharia law work? Are uh, women oppressed in the name of Islam? Mm. These these are just these are questions that transcend the left uh, left right wing divide that we know in the West. And and for those people who condemn the far right for being socially extreme, if you look at the agenda mm. of conservative Muslims or Orthodox Muslims or radical Muslims, call them what you like, in subordinating women being homophobic, dividing society into believers and unbelievers, and creating, a developing a discourse of hatred, they would qualify as extreme, as extreme right. Right, sure, yeah. Extreme right. But, but if you right. don't want to so be... So why don't they be labeled extreme right? Well, why I think if sometimes I, they are. But why if I and other people mm. criticize them, why are we labeled right wing? What is right wing about fighting for the equality between men and women? Right. But, what but, but, is but, but, right but, wing? But let me Let's just, what is well, right wing about anything that I have written in that book? But, well, I, okay, first of all, if you don't want to be ide ideologically identified, why align yourself with the American Enterprise Institute? Well, American Inter when I went to the American Enterprise Institute, the words right and left absolutely did not enter uh -huh. my head. It was a think tank that was interested in my ideas on. Islam, Islam in the West, Islam mm. in Europe, women in Islam. That is what I do. I think about that, and they look, all my colleagues only look at, and I do the same for them in the subjects that I have any understanding of, what is the evidence that they are presenting? And these ideas usually don't have anything to do with left or right. I do understand, and uh, the American Enterprise Institute is for a limited form of government, mm -hmm. that in the left-right divide, that is called right, right. off-center, yes. but you have uh, the argument that limited government is better than uh, an expanded government 
is often better. And if you want to call me right wing for that, then fine. Well, I, I mean, that might be part of it. You, know, you mm-hmm. should just, uh, you can own it. You, know, you say you're right wing. I mean, you know, you, say, you ask what it, what's in the book, uh, uh, you know, generally equating Islam with, with uh, dangerous ideas, uh, opposing multiculturalism, uh, um, saying that Western feminists have got it wrong. I mean, these are things that generally uh, we associate with the right wing. Let uh, me give you in all three of them. Okay. Islam is unfriendly towards women. Whether you're right wing or left wing, the evidence that you have tells you that, and it's the unfriendly people who are far right or extreme right. Um, fighting for the rights of Muslim women to have equal rights with others, I can't think that's what the left used to be about. Multiculturalism, the reason why I'm against it, it is it puts the collective at the center. That cannot possibly be left wing. I thought in the past that the left started with the individual liberalism as I learned it Mm -hmm. in Leiden in 1995 for the first time Mm -hmm. was all about putting the individual at the center of everything. Now, if that is right wing... That's not left wing. (laughs) It's not left wing, but it is is liberalism. I mean, necessarily. You know, classic liberalism is is considered right wing by some. Now we're getting... It's going to get a little silly. But but, uh, no, I think the collective, you know, in the certainly in the Marxist tradition would be considered a left wing idea. That would be the left wing, but liberalism. Liberalism originally with the idea of the ascendance of the individual ascendance sure. of the indi- yeah. preserving and creating institutions that uh, preserve the freedom of individuals liberalism and people in the United States who are pro multiculturalism hmm. call themselves liberals well I well, think the, li- the liberals of today are, are different from uh, the, the, the the you know the classic liberalism of uh, 200 years ago. So then years. I would suggest let's move away from all these labels. Let's discuss the real problems in society. <laughs> let's look at the evidence that they are there for it. And then let's, ha- you know, let's prioritize. And I think killing women, denying them education, subjecting them to female genital m- mutilation. These, I think, okay. combating that is a priority. Let me try it should th- be the priority l- of feminists. Let me try this one out on you. There are some people on the right who do love that you're a person of color from a Muslim background who has criticized Islam, multiculturalism, even open immigration. Do you ever worry that people miss the nuances of your arguments and just and see you as a symbol to advance their cause? I do not worry about that. They may do that, they may not do that. But in an open society where we address societal problems, again, the things that I'm talking about, they really do need major attention. These are, it's all about life and death for these women. I do not worry about what somebody somewhere might think and might, the nuance that he or she might miss. I went to a conference last year, and one of the founders of Google was asked the same question. Do you ever worry that the bad guys might use the Internet for whatever? And his answer, and I thought was brilliant, was ultimately the good that comes out of the internet and Google is far better for humanity than uh, a minority that might abuse the instrument. The same applies to the use of fire. The same applies to my arguments. Some people might abuse and misuse it, but I hope that the good that comes out of it uh, is far more important than what some right-wing white supremacists might do with it. Right. I didn't call them the bad guys. I just said, you know, the guy. <laughs> no, whatever. I mean, I, I mean, right, I guess right, right. I get the question over and over again. I'm if, sure you do. Yeah. If you talk about honor killings and you call them honor killing, maybe a white supremacist will come and use that as an argument. Right. For I him. wasn't actually that talking about white supremacists. I was talking about people who might, uh, might, you know, who uh, might want to exploit the uh, the gold mine that they found in someone uh, like yourself, a smart woman who's making these arguments and who, uh, you know, come comes from a Muslim background, etc. But uh, why would they exploit that and to what end? Why would they exploit a narrative that says, please, let's protect the rights of women living on our soil and open them. Let's include them into the law. That requires that Western societies start punishing the perpetrators and sheltering and protecting the victims of these radical Islamic mm and uh, misogynist uh, ideologies why would they abuse that i just it's not clear to well, me well it's not uh, okay you know what i think exploit was the wrong word i would say uh, the concern would be that um, uh, without you without going into the um, the depth and the reasoning of your arguments that they would use you as an example to advance their ideas that you may not always totally agree with that's what i'm saying 
Well... You can't do anything about that. N- no. In a democracy, we all are trying to advance our ideas and to gain a majority, and I hope to gain a majority of the liberal, at least people who believe that, um, again, the feminists, mm. uh, the humanists, uh, the mainstream ear in becoming aware of these problems and doing something about it. If that happens, then whoever is out there to, you know, use whatever conspiracy that you're talking about is not going to get a chance for it. If these problems disappear, then the people who we are afraid might exploit my my ideas um, have nothing to worry about. I'm sorry I'm keeping you here so long. I'm I'm enjoying the conversation so much. I just got a couple more questions for you. I, I, I wonder... If you're an optimistic person, in the book you examine your hopes for your young nieces and and nephews and cousins and your wish to have your own child. Are you more hopeful about the next generation than this one? I am, and I think it is more of an effort. If, again, we leave things to the jihadists, with the guys with their bad ideas, and we allow them to form and socialize young people simply because they're born into Islam and we don't compete with them, then I'm pessimistic. If we start competing with them and recognize not only the content that they're dispensing, but the media that they're using and the instruments that they're using, and we compete with them, then I'm optimistic. Mm. Uh, And you often write about what Islam could learn from the West. Is there anything the West could learn from the Quran? Uh, I would say what Muslims could learn. Islam is a theology. And it, it's it's just it's a given. It's a theology. It's a political theory. It's a social theory. Uh, but the adherents of those theories could learn, yes, a lot from from the Western experience, who had similar ideas mm-hmm. in the past. Uh, is there anything that uh, Westerners could learn from the Quran? It will take me a long time to think that <laughs> one through. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind. Not much. Mm. Wow. Just give me time to think about it. Okay. Maybe I'll end here. You've you've led led a very different life than the one your parents planned for you, uh, uh, and and not an easy one. You're 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 living with round the clock bodyguards, death threats. Do you ever have days, despite your very clear, strong convictions, where you regret the choices you've made? Where you just think, "Wow, what did I get myself into?" Well, I did have that first. In 1992-93, I had an ongoing number of months uh, and even extended two years of just pure guilt uh, because I had my father's feelings, I had my mother's feelings, I brought them shame, uh, or so I thought. I had it again in 2002 after, uh, again 2002-2004, when my father, uh, once again, he had forgiven me, came back, uh, and then once again was very angry and very sad. Uh, I regret to this day the death of Theo van Gogh. I know I didn't cause it, but sometimes I tell myself I wish I had tried harder in convincing him not to put his name on the film because that was something that we discussed. Uh, and again, the last one on my father's deathbed, I had m- a pangs of guilt and thinking, well, what if I had stayed? And now I don't feel that anymore. I thank you very much for making the time today. It's a good pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Do come back. Yeah, I will. Ayan Hirsi Ali. Uh, the new book is called Nomad. It's in stores now. It's published by Knopf. And Ayan Hirsi Ali has been with me here live in Studio Q.